Kubernetes for Humans. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Kubernetes for Humans podcast. Uh, today with me in the show, we have Chris. And Chris, I'll be happy if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. I'm Chris Bailey. Um, I work for IBM and I am the CTO for um, Instana Observability, which is our you know, modern full stack observability solution for operators and SREs. Yeah. So just for people who don't know Instana, I will say it's quite similar to Datadog, New Relic and other players. Is that like a correct, like a... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We all kind of we're trying to solve the same problem. There's obviously differences in the approaches that each of us take, but yes, it's it's you know, we're competing products. Okay, so before like we'll talk about Instana and like what you're currently doing, I'd be happy if you can share a bit about your background. Like, how did you get into tech uh, observability and in general? So share a bit about your journey. Yeah, so my my kind of like entry point into working on technology was actually um, working on uh, implementations of Java and JVMs, right? So I started by working on programming languages and runtimes for programming languages. So you know, I started, um, as I said, working with Java. Mm -hmm. Now, from Java, I kind of moved a little bit sideways. I started working in the open source community for Node.js in some of its earlier days. Um, I led a, a set of working groups on things like monitoring and diagnostics, performance benchmarking, and so on. Um, and from working on Java and Node, I then... Chris, I have to ask, like, how did it happen? You know, moving from Java to Node.js is like a... It's quite a big jump. Like, it's not uh, the trivial thing that uh, most people do. So so give, well, give us like a... On the... Some people think it's very small because, you know, Java, JavaScript, surely they're the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's more... Um, so, you know, I'm you know, 23 years in IBM, right? So I was and working on IBM's implementations of Java. And the way that kind of started back in the day was like this pretty much predates open source. So what <laughs> would happen is there was specification, right? So um, Sun, as the creators of Java, created the Java specification and the specification for the JVM in the runtime. Mm -hmm. And then other vendors could then create compliant versions. And they primarily did that for their kind of operating systems and platforms, right? So IBM took Java and made it run on IBM hardware, Power, AIX, et cetera, right? And that's kind yeah. of what they did. Now, as well as wanting to get Java to run on IBM platforms, things like Node.js and other languages are also interesting. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of where the sideways move happened. It was, yeah, you know, I've been working on foundational runtime technology for Java when we were interested in doing similar things for other languages. Mm -hmm. at, at the lowest level, there's a lot of commonality, right? Mm -hmm. um, most runtimes are actually written in C, C++, and assembly. Yeah. Um, most of them are doing some level of interpreting the higher level language into okay. a set of operations codes, op codes, and how those are executed. So it's actually, you know, at the technology level, it's it's more of an evolution than you might expect. Of course, yeah. at the programming level, yes, you're going from something that is, you know, um, a typed language to a very dynamic language, and, and that's a little bit different. But um, yeah, that was kind of my first step was to move from Java to Node.js. Um, okay. From Node.js, I then started working in the Swift community. Mm -hmm. So... Um, this was kind of, IBM had a, a quite a deep relationship with Apple around mobile development. And yeah. as Swift as a programming language to replace Objective-C started to come around, um, we helped Apple open source the project. Um, and they were very interested in making Swift a um, you know, widely adopted language, not just one that's inside the Apple ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So myself, some of IBM research, some of IBM development, um, worked to get Swift up and running on Linux, get it into server environments, um, create an HTTP stack for it, create a microservice framework, build a server-side ecosystem around it. Yes, then. So I kind of, you know, my career kind of started with programming languages. From there, I moved up to how to build 
frameworks and microservice frameworks around it. My next There's role after that moved on to, you know, how do you build developer tools? How do you build CICD pipelines, deploy capabilities, particularly around microservices and cloud native? Yeah, um, so I kind of went from programming right. languages to frameworks, yeah, like, microservices, going like and now onto operations. Quite interesting and quite unique, like, you know, quite unique route because I don't think I had a lot of guests in the show that come from, you know, such a low level, like, um, like you know, like working on the, like you said yourself, like the assembly and C, and then going up the stack, up the stack, and like cloud native, it feels to me like it's not the opposite of writing like the, you know, the instruction for the computer, but it's almost like a, like a really different ball game, I guess, from all all sides. <laughs> so what, what okay, was like your first project when you moved to building like the CI CD and like what like what was the project? Like IBM have its own CI CD? I, I I'll be honest that I don't remember. So so should, yeah. should you there. Yeah. So IBM was kind of building its own um platform around Kubernetes. That's it. Um so we were working in the Tecton community to you know help build out Tecton build capabilities, sure. have that as part of our platform. How long, how much time ago it was? Uh, how long ago was it? Like Tecton is quite, you know, quite new, right? Like, is it like four or five, six years? Like what's the Yeah, pattern? this was four, maybe five years ago. Um, so I was doing you know, work around Tecton, around Argo CD, around how you specify a layout GitOps project structures. Um, mm -hmm. And how you bring that back to development. So as developers are writing code, it's already designed so that it goes through CI/CD. It has um, GitOps as the the target approach for deploy, and that we were making it easy for developers and you know, application yeah. teams to build cloud native solutions. Can I ask you know like I have like a couple of questions here, but I'll start. But what is the motivation maybe? Like, you know, you you are IBM, right? Like 23 years, like, like mm. you guys don't get paid because Tacton is better or worse, like, or, or do you? Like, uh, like in the end of the day, it's a lot of open source projects and a lot of like firepower on that direction. So maybe even if you can before that, like, why does IBM invest the time? Like, what's the strategy and like, what's the goal and why, right? Like, uh... yeah, I mean, so if you look at, the vendors that are kind of doing this. So you've got Rancher. Hey, no. Rancher is creating a distribution of Kubernetes Rivers. and you know, a level of simplification around that to make it easier for developers to build and deploy operations okay. teams to run. Um, you know, Red Hat, you know, a subsidiary of IBM, we do exactly the same thing with OpenShift, with the Red Hat developer tools and so on. You know, VMware doing the same thing with Tanzu. Right. So you know, this is essentially how you go from um, Kubernetes as you know a, a bare substrate to how do you build a platform and the ecosystem around it, and to a certain extent being opinionated about that to make it easier for particularly enterprise customers to adopt, run that at scale, have you know, not just tens of teams you know, building and deploying, but potentially hundreds of, of different teams across their enterprise trying to standardize yep. the so so like your end game you, you know that just so i make sure that you know clear you're saying like ibm <laughs> wants like very large enterprises like to utilize even more like cloud native resources and so on and to do so they or they are investing in the overall ecosystem so it will be easier for let's say i'm apple to adopt uh, Tacton and like uh, and like Kubernetes in general and so on, so like that's yeah. the main KPI here. It, exactly, and that's what we do through Red Hat and OpenShift, right? Uh -huh. So, um, OpenShift is very much like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, right? Uh -huh. If you think about what RHEL provides, it's it's an opinionated kind of operating system because mm -hmm. yes, there's the core Linux kernel, but there's also device drivers and other packages required to give a complete platform. Oh. OpenShift is doing the same thing for Kubernetes, right? You take Kubernetes, but you also want service mesh. You also oh. want build capabilities. You also want a continuous deployer. 
Well, so it's taking a set of those, ensuring they integrate smoothly and work together and providing that as a single package so that, yes, large enterprise customers aren't trying to do this themselves. They're not trying to curate, select which are the best projects to be using, try and get those working a combination. Mm -hmm. Having to make, if they need enterprise support, get support from various different places. It's a single simplified solution for them. Okay. Okay. That, that makes sense. And that even makes like a lot of sense. And I know that IBM is like one of the biggest contributors to all of like the Kubernetes ecosystem in general. Okay. So uh, now let's get back to the story. So you were working on like a Tacton, which like, I don't know, like uh, again, like uh, when I, when I observe it or started working with it like five or six years right. ago, it was kind of like we are replacing <laughs> Jenkins, but we're best friend with Jenkins. So maybe like if you can give a bit on, you know, why should they use it? What's the alternative? Okay. What's the current status? And so, yeah, if you don't mind like a bit about that, because it was super yeah. interesting project, like I'll be honest. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start by saying I've not worked on Tecton for probably three or four years personally, <laughs> right? So that work is now being you know carried forward inside our, our OpenShift team, right? I moved on to doing the operation side of things, observability and so on, but um, mm -hmm. so back then there was, you know, in any given space, there's lots of different vendors taking slightly different approaches to solving the same problem. Mm -hmm. Now, yep. one of the big things by Tecton was making it cloud native, right? It is running on Kubernetes itself. It is using, you know, CRDs as a way of declaring stages and steps. Mm -hmm. So for anyone that's becoming familiar with the Kubernetes ecosystem, how you configure how you deploy, it's natural for you, right? It's an extension okay. of exactly what you had. Okay. Okay. So, so you worked on that and like how, when you left the project, what was the status like in terms of adoption or features or just. So certainly from our perspective, we got it to the point that, you know, it was now becoming an integrated part of the platform. Good then. So when I kind of moved roles. Um, the last thing I did was hand over um, a set of work that we had been doing um, as IBM to Red Hat as the subsidiary. So mm -hmm. um, Red Hat, um, OpenShift build pipelines are Tecton. Um, yeah. you, um, OpenShift continuous delivery is Argo CD, right? Um, so we've now completely kind of productized this as just a standard part of the, the OpenShift platform now. Okay. Super cool. So where did you left after like working on that? Like what was the next step for you? Yeah. So it was from there, as I said, I kind of moved into observability and operations. Um, so, um, in Stana, which is where I am now, um, was a company that IBM acquired. Cool. Um, and I kind of worked as part of the acquisition team doing the evaluation of Instana, um, working with them as a company to understand whether you know, our vision for where we wanted to go with observability matched you know, their their ethos, their DNA as a, a company that we were looking to acquire. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, that's what I've kind of been doing for the last four years, working with the Instana team. And now I kind of lead them from a, a technical perspective and a technical strategy point of view. Okay, so before we dive, we like we'll dive, <laughs> deep dive a bit about Instana. What do you do? What do you do different? And a bit about you know what's your what's your ethos, right? And what's your like vision around observability? I will say that Instana, oh, even before the acquisition, was quite like a unique unique piece in the in the ecosystem. You know, I again like as a user, there was the let's call him like the legacy system, like the app dynamics plan, maybe Dynatrace is like the first very adopted generation of like uh, APM solutions. And then come the new kids on the block, I will say like Datadog and uh, New Relic that made it much more accessible for like everyone can use like APM. And Instana was like, we're also going to be in the APM, but it's going to be much more cloud native, Dockerized. And they were very like, you know, uh, even when we founded Commodore, like me and Ben, I did took, I, I did took like a lot of inspiration because it is like, how do we take old concept, like old concept, you know, observability around like, how do I like detect issues, investigate them, solve them in a simplified way. 
but take them from legacy system into something completely different. So I will say like I was like a, a big, and I also told you when I invited you to the podcast, I was like a very big like, fan of, of Instana back in the day. And they had the, this cute robot as a mascot. So it was, it was nice. And so what's that, you know, why did you acquire them? Like if you, if you can speak a bit, a, a bit about like what is their third synergy that you had and four years after the acquisition, how are things going? Yeah, so to kind of some of your first point there. So a lot of the the major vendors in the observability space. So when you think about New Relic, Dynatrace, Dates Dog, App Dynamics, and so on, mm -hmm. um, all of these have been around for fifteen plus years. Now Kubernetes has not been around that long. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So one of the big advantages Instana had was it was actually born in a Kubernetes world, uh, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at kind of like the history of um, monitoring and operations tools, typically what happens is um, they end up having to react to changes in the way that we do development and delivery of applications and infrastructure, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. it used to be that the de facto way you built applications was um, three-tier architectures, right? You had mm -hmm. some kind of monolithic database. You uh, had an application server that sat in front of it that served web apps or maybe APIs, right? And that was your three tier. And mm -hmm. all of that on, on you know, a set of bare metal machines or virtual machines. Mm -hmm. So you had like precisely three or four technologies that you needed to work with. Yeah. So what happened was you had specialist database monitoring tools, specialist mm -hmm. you. Know, infrastructure, virtual machine, physical machine mm -hmm. monitoring tools. You have specialized tools for monitoring your application server. Um, and you kind of could deal with the fact that you've got specialized tools because you had the database admin team ran the database. You had the middleware team monitor the and manage the, the, the application server. You had an infrastructure team. And mm -hmm. These environments did not change rapidly. Right? They would roll out a new release of an application once a quarter. And yeah. this was a big deal. And you would get the three teams in a room together to monitor each of their tools to make sure nothing went wrong. Sure. Now, application design delivery has evolved, right? We went from three tier to there was service oriented architecture. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have some kind of like messaging bus and we're going to have lots of components that sit around that. And now we have a few more teams. And then we moved to microservices, right? And if you think about that spectrum, we went from single database, single application server, single type of machines, update frequency that's measured in months, to tens or hundreds of individual components, each of those paired potentially with their own database, with the freedom to choose the right database for the types of data. So no longer is it an Oracle Rack cluster. It is we're using Postgres and CouchDB and MongoDB and Redis and ClickHouse and Elastic. You know, they're all inside one solution. So we've now got a scale of technologies, right? No, everyone's not just using Java or .NET anymore. Ruby, Python, Erlang, Go, etc. Right? You've suddenly got an explosion of scale. And everything is now dynamic. Mm -hmm. We've got a platform where it can auto scale. We've got a platform that deals with clustering and, and replicas. Right. We've got the idea that developers should be able to release on demand. Right. We've gone from every three months to it went down to once a month, down to once a week. And there are some companies who are delivering daily or even multiple times a day. Mm -hmm. This idea that hey, we've got three teams, they're specialists in technologies, and when there's a release, they can just get in a room together and they mentally understand the relationships between everything. We're... That's no longer possible. So the tools have to give you that kind of information. They need to be able to understand multiple different databases. The fact that the connections between those are to services, the connections between services can change on any given release. These things are auto-scaling, deliveries happen frequently, 
right? It's no longer possible to understand that this all in your head and for you to be current. The mm-hmm. tools now need to give you the insights. And that's where that transition from monitoring to observability happened, right? It's now a, a complete full stack view of everything yep. that you've got. Now doing it far more in real time so that as things are changing constantly, you've actually got an up-to-date view of everything that's happening as it happens. Okay. Okay. Like, you know, I completely agree with, with everything that you are you are saying here. You know, it's it's part of the reasons, you know, first of all, that we you know, founded Commodore, right. but we see it across the stack. But like that, that explains maybe like why a tool like Instana is needed. Why should IBM acquire it? Like, you know, they were their own like company, quite successful, I want to say. And so why, why did you guys like wanted to acquire them and how, how is it, you know, as the bigger vision of IBM? Yeah. I mean, so on one side, right, we've got a long history of providing monitoring tools. Mm -hmm. I think the right term there is monitoring tools in that if you go back to the being able to support those, um, you know, three tier architectures, SOA, that's what the technology had been designed for. Now, Mm -hmm. The switch to this huge level of dynamic scale complexity, um, you can tr- re- try and rebuild the technology that you've got. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's much easier and you end up with a much better solution if you always start from a blank sheet of paper. Mm-hmm. That's what Instan had done. They'd started from a blank sheet of paper, understanding the scale requirements, understanding that you have to deal with containers and Kubernetes as a first class system. Now, of mm-hmm. course, that doesn't mean Instana can't work with those legacy environments. In fact, it's easier because they're not dynamic, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You could have a, a monitoring capability that says, I can deal with processes coming and going, and containers coming and going. But of course, if they just stay static, it's just an easier environment. Mm-hmm. So for us, it was around, you know, there's this really fundamental change in the way development deployment is happening. Mm-hmm. You need something that is really designed and optimized for that. And that's what Instana presented to us, right? That's that's where they were. That was their their core vision. Mm, that, that, that sounds, you know, like that, that that makes total sense. So four years later, where is Instana now? Like what changed and what's the current vision? Did, did something change in the core mission or in the technology perspective? Like. Yeah, what happened in the last four years? Yeah, so one of the things about um, you know, having a technology that you know, was really only three, three and a half years old at the point we acquired. Right? When you look at that, you know, as I said, Datadog, Dynatrace, New Relic, etc., all you know, fifteen plus years old. Right? Yeah. So there's gaps in capability and coverage. Right. Uh-huh. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing over the last four years uh-huh. is to close out a lot of those those gaps in terms of like core capability that you might expect. Um, so one of those is the ability to run synthetic tests. Right. right. I've got an API or an endpoint. I want uh-huh. to be able to make requests of that to make sure it's still you know, working correctly. I want to be able to run those from locations around the globe. Right. So there were things like that that we had to build in to you know, close some capabilities that most people expect these kinds of tools to provide. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we've been doing, and this is, was a big part of our acquisition case was where we wanted to take the capability. And really we talk about Instana as having three kind of unique, um, differentiators, value propositions. Mm -hmm. Last is. We look at doing um, what we call ubiquitous automation, right? One of the goals of Instana is to automate everything, right? So the way we set up monitoring, um, in the case of Kubernetes, you deploy um, the Instana agent um, as a daemon set, an operator, a helm chart. That deploys an instance of the Instana agent on each of the underlying worker nodes. From there... It, of course, allows us to monitor, collect information about the worker node itself, but it discovers everything that runs on the worker node. So mm-hmm. you look at every single container that's placed on that worker node. 
we look at what's running inside each of the containers and we then do auto instrumentation of everything that's there so the first thing we're auto discovering everything that you've got we're then auto instrumenting it the agents in fact can auto update themselves so you don't need to maintain them and what we're doing there is we're building this kind of like digital twin representation of everything that you've got running. Um, so we know that you have namespaces with services, with deployments, with pods, with containers. We know which worker node those containers are on. We know their CPU usage. We know if there's a problem because it's being throttled because of the underlying host. We know you know, all of the relationships that are happening. And because we've auto-instrumented the workloads, let's say you've got a Node.js service that's making a call to a Java service. We track that request. And in fact, we track every single request occurring in the system. Are you using like eBPF or something like that? Like how is the instrumentation being done like inside the cluster? So the instrumentation mechanism depends on the technology that we're instrumenting. So for things like Java, um, Java has the ability to do late attach, yeah. which allows us to put an instrumentation agent into the runtime. That allows us to, so let's say you've written a REST API, right? Um, you've probably done that using the JAXRS um, API standard. So we instrument JAXRS. We know there's an incoming request, what the API was. If you're making a database call, we instrument the JDBC library. So we see the request coming in. We see it then going out to the database. We're capturing you know, the HTTP headers. We're capturing the select statement, the SQL that's being called. We Perfect. see this as set to end request. And in fact, that journey doesn't just start inside Kubernetes or you know, your VMs or your compute. We start okay. at end user monitoring. So web and mobile front ends, we can track users on the website on mobile devices, what they're doing in the page views or the tables. As that okay. makes a request to the back end, we track the request to the back end. We track it through load balancers, proxies, into services, onto databases, and all the way back again. Um, and we're building this as, as I said, like a digital twin of everything that's executing. And as pods get deployed, replica counts change because of the horizontal pod autoscaler and so on. We see that dynamically changing, and we've got a complete current view of everything that's executing. And as I said, this is all about kind of automating the end-to-end um, you know, role that you need to do for operations to auto-detect incidents to help you resolve those as quickly as possible. So on one side, we try and automate everything. Okay. The next is we do collect that 100% of every single request going through the system. We okay. also collect metrics like CPU and memory and disk or mm. heap usage in a JVM and, and so on every single second. Um, and the idea of collecting every second is to make sure that we don't miss yeah. crucial information. Right? You've been at 100% CPU for five seconds. So by collecting every second, we see that. If we were collecting every 10 or 30 seconds, if you're getting an average, I suddenly see that you're at 50% CPU. Or if I'm sampling the value at that time, I might have missed the window at which there was 100% CPU. So we collect the highest kind of fidelity data of any of the vendors. Right? We are pretty unique in the rate that we collect data and our ability to then you know, represent that on this, this digital twin so that we've got a complete copy almost of what's executing in our data model. And then that allows us to do a lot of analytics. So you know, people often talk for things like AI, it's garbage in, garbage out. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the better mm-hmm. data that you've got, the more complete the data, the more accurate the data, the better the analytics that we can do. Well, so that then comes back to like this end-to-end automation, right? So we can automatically detect problems in the system. Now, usually, when there are problems, you tend to get a cascade failure, right? Yeah. Whilst you know, we talk about you should build fault tolerance into your applications. Yeah. The no. success rate of being genuinely fault tolerant no, is like, pretty low. No, like, like it's a nice to, you know, it's a nice to have. Like I, I will say, like, like it's not a nice to have. Like it's really hard to achieve. 
uh, especially when migrating right. like legacy application. You know, application was built in a certain way. Right. You maybe wanted right. to be like 12 app, all of this, which is great if you are building your own startup, for example. Uh, but it's not really, you know, like I'm a big bank. I'm not going to rewrite everything that I'm doing just so, you know, like it, it will take too much time. It, exactly. So what okay. tends to happen is when there is a problem, you have a cascade throughout the system. So you well, go from you know, a fundamental problem to seeing you know, maybe 10 or 15 things that are broken as a result. So the first thing that we do is collect all of those that are related together and say, look, these all form part of the same problem. Mm -hmm. But not only that, we're then analyzing the flow data um, to understand which is cause and which is effect. Right? Right. That this service is showing errors at the API because when we follow the requests to that API, it goes to a database. It's actually the database that's returning the errors. And the yeah. database is returning the errors because, hey, it's run out of disk space and that's causing the problem. So we're automatically following the chain of data to be able to turn around to you and say, look, here's everything that's broken. They're all broken because of the same underlying root cause. And that underlying root cause is that you've run out of disk space. Okay. The next so thing. We so almost ran out of time or like we're closing yeah. to a, to out of time. So let me ask you like two hard questions, three hard questions to, to, to finish the podcast. So it will be like quite interesting. And then, and, and, and then we'll wrap it. And uh, just cause I want to be aware of like everyone time. First question. And I guess you guys are getting it quite a lot, but how are you different than Datadog, let's say, or Dynatrace, right? Like, you know, I, I had to hear the VP engineering of uh, Datadog or like fast. <laughs> Sounds pretty much like what everything that you just said. Again, but, don't want to be disrespectful or anything like that, but uh, what do you answer people? So at its core, like, we are pretty much the only vendor that collects 100% of every request going through the system. Okay. And that allows us to do a lot of kind of yeah. pretty unique things. So the first is like, we actually know exactly how many requests are coming from like mobile devices versus web devices. We actually know who those end users are. Right. Because for every end user request, we've got the back end request that happens as a result. Mm -hmm. now, one side, the side effect of this is when there's an incident, we can tell you who's affected. If there's an error that occurs, we've got that request that had the error. Um, so when we collect things like application logs, so let's say from your application, you've written a log message, there's been an error. We can actually capture that as part of the request. So for any log message you've got, it's like, okay, I want to see the request that caused that error message to understand why it was caused, right? This level of data, as I said, on right. one, it gives you, you know, unparalleled insights. There's right. never going to be working on a problem where you didn't have the data, but it also yep. allows us to do that automatic analysis. So this idea yeah. that we're actually following the trace records and using that to help you understand where the cause of the problem is, this is completely unique. No one else is doing that. And it's because they lack the data to be able to do it in a reliable way. It, it sounds like a huge challenge from a technical side, building this monster, but we won't have time to dip into that even now. I'm sure it's super, super interesting. Second hard question, maybe, what is the biggest challenge for you guys right now? Like what is in the future or <laughs> what do you see is like the most, you know, I mean, like challenge or opportunity if you want to take it as like a more or like a optimistic view. Yeah. So, so for us, um, let's call it an opportunity. So <laughs> the opportunity is like, so the other part of this explosion of scale is that, you know, as I said, we used to have three tier architectures with experts for each of the technologies. If I'm an SRE, and I'm now running or you know, expected to, to, to support an environment that's got five different data stores. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to know how to solve the problems with each of those data stores, right? I can't be an expert in such a huge set of technologies. So one of the challenges in ops has always been, even if we can give you all of the data, even if we can get you down to what the problem is, the next problem is, what do I do about it? Right. Yeah. If I'm told that my, I'm got increasing lag on a Kafka topic, how do you actually fix that? Um, 
And for us, this is what we started doing with generative AI. Right? Yeah, then Actually, you know, mining information from knowledge bases so that we can automatically present relevant in information to the ops team. So that you know, for the simple case of running out of disk space, it can tell you, well, you can expand the volume, you can delete files, you can migrate files to a backup. And so they immediately get presented with all of the options. And one of the things yeah. in human psychology is usually like, we come up with a solution and then become narrowly focused on that. And we don't look at what the alternative options would be. So we can automatically present that to you. And then not only that, it's how do you actually then know how to do that? I, so I need to expand the volume. How mm -hmm. do I actually do that? Well, again, mm -hmm. provide you with you know, actual operations tasks, you know, automations that can implement that for you. So the ops team stays in control. But all of that expertise is presented to them. So it's, they get to decide like, okay, this is how I'm going to solve it. Here's an implementation that does it for me. Um, and that vastly reduces the, the time to actually resolve problems once they've been identified. Uh, it's super interesting. And like, again, like a lot of similarities with what we are seeing, you know, some of the things that we're doing in Kubernetes was super interesting. And last question, like not related necessarily to Nistana, what does the future have in store in terms of what is the biggest trend or thing that you're seeing from a technology standpoint in general, like in, across the ecosystem? Gen AI, you mentioned it a bit, something else? Um, so I think we have on one side this factor of scale. I think <laughs> on the other side, I think we're increasingly going to see people moving workloads to the edge, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Workloads closer to yeah, yeah. to the, uh, the the users, whether those are machine users or human users. So I think we're going to end up with multi-tier um, topologies and multi-tier solutions. I think scale is going to continue to get bigger. And yes, like almost every single medium to large company in the world at the moment is trying to work out how to add more AI into their own solutions. And then, of course, we need a better solution for how you observe and understand how that AI is executing. Okay, okay Chris, I think like a, a great ending to a great episode. It's been a pleasure having you here. Anything else that you want to to, uh, to say to, to conclude? No, just to say thank you for, for inviting me and, and spending time to talk. Uh, it, it, you, I will say like it's one of the most like interesting, like talk, talking from uh, the starting point that you had around like the like Ryan writing the Java to IBM yeah, yeah, yeah. to observability yeah, yeah. of like edge applications. So you know qu Dude. qu quite a lot of you know quite an interesting journey. And like I said, pleasure having you Chris. Bye bye. Thank you. Kubernetes for humans.